So if you guys remember last week, we dealt with the sufficiency of Scripture as it relates to evangelism or as it relates to our witness. And uh, we looked at a lot of different passages as we were we were talking about that topic and uh, kind of ran out of time there at the end before we got into a few more passages that I wanted to talk about. So I thought we could just revisit this issue and kind of expand on it and even if there were any questions or uh, or thoughts that any of you have, maybe share them this morning. But to get us started with that, we, let's go back and read Psalm 19 again and remind ourselves of the basis of this topic. Psalm 19. exciting up there. <laughs> All right, so I'll start reading verse 1, if you've got that. Psalm 19, verse 1, he says, The heavens are telling of the glory of God, and their expanse is declaring the work of His hands. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth and their utterances to the end of the world. In them he has placed the tent for the sun, which is a bridegroom coming out of his chamber. It rejoices as a strong man to run his course. Its rising is from one end of the heavens and its circuit to the other end of them. And there is nothing hidden from its heat. And now, the special revelation that God's given us in verse 7, he says, The law of the Lord is perfect restoring the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever, and the judgments of the Lord are true. They are righteous altogether. They are more desirable than gold, yes, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned, and in keeping them there is great reward. Who can discern his errors? Equip me of hidden faults. Also keep back your servant from presumptuous sins. Let them not rule over me. And then I will be blameless, and I shall be acquitted of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. And so if you remember, we, we divided this passage into two different sections, that first being the general <coughs> revelation of God, what the created world around us declares about God, what it declares about his nature, and then the special revelation of God, the information that God has given us through his prophets and apostles and through his son that we now have recorded in the word of God, what it does internally for us, how it changes our heart, heart, how it restores us, enlightens us, gives us the information that we need for salvation and is even the means by which we are saved through the power of the Holy Spirit. And so God's general revelation and God's special revelation. But then also, if you remember, we, we jumped over to Romans 1, and we talked about this concept of general revelation and the, the evidence that's been placed before our eyes. And we saw in Romans 1, verse 18, he says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness, because that which is known about God is evident within them. For God made it evident to them, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power, and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. For even though they know God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations and their foolish 
foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. Therefore, God gave them over in the lust of their hearts to impurity so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. And so, who remembers the, the implication that we drew between these two passages? So, first and foremost in Psalm 19, that the heavens declare the glory of God, that he has revealed himself to creation through all of the things that have, that have been made, but then also this truth in Romans 1, that although he has revealed himself, man rejects this truth. He rejects the information. But what's, what, are the, what are some implications that are drawn for that? Or what are some questions that you may have? They're without excuse. They're without excuse, number one. Right. Yeah. Who, who, is, who is without excuse? Everyone. 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 Yeah. Mm-hmm. What about people who don't ever hear the gospel? Everyone. <laughs> Good answer. Good answer. <laughs> the revelation that they've been given. It's interesting, the progression. It starts with them not honoring God. And then from there, it moves on from verse 24 through the rest of the chapter, describing the progression of, of what happens when we don't honor God and we don't, you know, when, when we don't honor God and. Uh, it says it became few and the thoughts and foolish hearts were darkened, and then professing to be wise, it became fools. And then from that, from that position, they move on to the, to the next step, which was, you know, we know what the next step was. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and yeah, and as you trace that whole line out through the rest of the chapter there, it, it really describes what we're seeing all around us in our right. world today, doesn't it? Yeah. Just the the complete denial of God's standards, the complete denial of an absolute standard of morality that's applied to man, and just a rejection of that, and uh, and then God allowing the population to ultimately have what they want, which is to live without a standard. They they can't even think correctly because there is no standard to think by, and you know we often we often see the implications of this being played out in society, you know, and we can even wonder what in the world is going on, what's wrong with these people? It's like they don't even have logic. It's like they can't even think correctly. And we know why. We can come back to why right here in Romans 1. Well, it's because they have initially rejected God. They have rejected His truth. They reject, they, they can look around them and they see the evidence of God around them, but yet they reject the evidence that's there. We had an interesting conversation. Um, I don't know if you came by at any point or you guys are already going, I think. But uh, Michael and I had an interesting conversation with a young man at uh, the campus this past week. And uh, this young man was a, uh, had grown up in, in LDS church and had rejected that and left that. And he's obviously a very intelligent young man. He, he was, um, you could tell he was a smart guy. But he uh, fancied himself now as being sort of an agnostic and believed that it was almost his mission in life to prove that religion was, was all religions were false. You know, there's ultimately no, no religion. They all come from the same place, you know, from man's imagination. And so that was kind of his mission when he came over to talk to us. He, he, was, he set out for the purpose of proving that what we believe was wrong. And the way that he went about doing that was through different philosophical arguments and different scientific arguments. And, you know, for us, because we believe that these things are true, it can be very tempting to try to defend what we believe according to philosophical truth, because God can be proven philosophically, and scientific truth, because there is evidence for God scientifically. But really, ultimately, we weren't getting anywhere with that young man. Why, why is that? He's blinded to the truth. Yeah. He's starting out, his world is starting out with an entirely different perspective than, than you guys are starting out. From the, yeah. the beginning of the, the basis of his argument is here from the starting point. 
Yeah, totally different worldview. Using totally the different wrong standard for truth. You know what? Using the wrong standard for truth. Exactly. Absolutely. So what was his standard of truth? Himself. General revelation. Yeah. He said he said it was general revelation. That was his argument. I, I'm just objective, I'm arguing based off the evidence. But in reality, he was the standard of truth. And that's what we ultimately had you know had to confront with him, you know. And uh one thing that he said was, you know, if God were to come back right now and stand in front of me and do some one of these miraculous things that you hear about in the Bible, then I would absolutely believe. There's no way that I could reject it then. I would believe. And you know what I said to him? No, you wouldn't. You wouldn't. Why is that? <laughs> well, he's close-minded. He's not open to new revelation. We have examples. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, you're fine. We have examples all through Scripture of people seeing the evidence, seeing the miracles, and then going back to unbelief. The Pharisees and Sadducees are one of the most glaring <coughs> examples of that to me. Their their very Savior that that had been testified about them about. Uh, the testimonies about him were in their scriptures. The Pharisees at least accepted the the revelation of Jesus Christ. It all lined up perfectly. So the evidence was there. So the the written evidence was there. But then also Christ is standing in front of them, proclaiming the truth to them and doing miracles. And Jesus even said, if you don't believe me, if you don't believe my words, then believe the signs, believe the works that the Father is doing through me. This testifies to the fact that I am deity. And yet, what did they do? They, they rejected him. Even after he was resurrected from the dead, the, the Sadducees and the, the leaders, they concocted a scheme to try and cover up the miraculous resurrection of the Son of God. And so no matter what miracle was done, no matter what happened in front of them, they were totally and completely blinded to it. They would not accept it. So coming back to that, it can be very tempting for us to try to evidentially prove the existence of God in our evangelism or to philosophically prove the existence of God in our evangelism when we're, when we're trying to bring a person to understand uh, salvation, but ultimately, go ahead. Uh, also, the spiritual side of it, he's a dead man. The natural man receives not the things of the spirit of God. Neither can he know them because he's spiritually disconnected. So he's a he's a dead man uh, that can't receive until uh, the Holy Spirit enlightens him or draws him. Mm -hmm. And so you're almost like talking to a wall. You know, Jesus said in in the uh, I think it was an Acts that they don't receive you, you just uh, shake the dust off your feet and go to the next. One. He didn't say try to persuade him that I'm alive. Just keep going. You know what I'm saying? I know we try to reach out, but you have to read spiritually. Is he dead? And it seems like he's rejected uh, the knowledge that was given to him. Uh, and so he's a dead man. So he, there's a point, that you belabor the point with people, I think, uh, trying to convince them because you'll never convince them. And you'll never know exactly what happened to him in the Mormon church, too. Exactly. What turned him off like that to make him feel that way, which he's carrying over and not being open-minded to anything new. Absolutely. Unless the Holy Spirit's at work, um, you're not going to make any headway. <laughs> Plant seeds, move on. Yeah, yeah and so what, what you were saying, you know, that's in accordance with the Ephesians 2, right? You might want to turn to Ephesians 2. And maybe somebody could read uh, verses 1 through 3, Ephesians 2, 1 through 3. And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. The spirit who now works in the son of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the other one. Absolutely. That's what we were. We were, just like them, dead 
in our trespasses and sins. We were enslaved to sin, unable to raise ourselves back to life, and no amount of evidence was going to bring us back from the dead. That is evidence outside of Scripture, at least. And so there is no way that a person is saved outside of the testimony of the Scriptures. It is the Holy Scriptures. It is the proclaimed gospel of Jesus Christ that the Holy Spirit then uses to regenerate the heart of man. That's the means that he's chosen to save people through. And so no one will be saved apart from the preaching of the gospel, as we talked about last night from Romans 10. We must preach. We must proclaim the truth. We must bring the truth of God's word to bear on the hearts of people or they won't be saved. So back to that young man on, on the campus. Um, he got to a point where he was, he was actually becoming belligerent and blasphemous and, and uttering blasphemous things against God uh, because of the truth that God says about himself in, in his word. And I think Pastor Michael did, did an excellent thing when, when that began. What he did what was he didn't present an evidential argument. He didn't present a philosophical argument, but rather he brought the young man back to the truth of Scripture back to something that young man said was subjective. That's subjective. I, you know, I don't believe any of that. Well, you may not believe it, but in, within this is the power to convict and save, not outside of it. And so Pastor Michael said, you know, according to the Word of God, one day your mouth will be stopped, and you will stand before this God that you're now blaspheming, and you will give an account. It's going to happen. That is the truth. Amen. And you're going to have to give an account for your heart for your rebellion against him. And so you still have time today while you're still alive to turn from this pathway that you're on and submit yourself to Jesus Christ. And yeah, he didn't want to hear that. Obviously. <laughs> well, that argument is interesting because uh, my dad's like that same thing. He said, well, I don't believe that. Like, like saying I don't believe that absolves him from any responsibility of the truth, and that and that argument or discussion you're having that that you know, man is the same thing. Just because you don't believe it's true, doesn't make it not true. Yeah, you know, and, and you can't prove that it's not true. Exactly, either. it's like and so. Know, if you don't believe in gravity, if you jump off that roof, you're still gonna. You know, you're still going to be splattered on the ground when you hit it. So because you don't believe in gravity, it doesn't mean that it's not true. And that's that's an argument that I hear all the time. Oh, well, that's that's your truth. That's not my mm -hmm. truth. Yeah. Well, said, no, it is the truth. There is. There's only one truth. There is no. real truth, whether you want to believe it or not. Yeah, the postmodern world does not want to hear that there's an absolute standard for truth. Not at all. But there is. There absolutely yeah. is. And. And so, you know, after, after Michael had that discussion with him, then, you know, you brought up a good point last week about our personal testimony. Well, then what I wanted to share with him was what Christ had done personally within my heart. So as someone who was enslaved to self-worship. And, and when I said that, he said, are you saying that I'm enslaved to self-worship? And I said, yes, absolutely. You are. You are a self-worshipper. That is what you are. And, you know, he didn't have anything to say to that. He, he would argue the evidential stuff all day long, but, but the minute I said, yes, I do believe that you are, he didn't have anything to respond to that because he knows within himself that he is a self-worshipper. He knows that. I wish I would have been there because I could have maybe delved a little bit further because coming from the same background, maybe a little bit more truth would have come out. Yeah, that, that would have been great. Um, I, I gave him a testimony of what the Lord had done in my life. Uh, and I said, I realize you think that that's subjective, but it's true. And I know that there's no way you can prove otherwise because the Lord has changed me. He has brought me into a saving knowledge of Him. And my prayer is that He brings you into a saving knowledge of Him as well. And from that point forward, the conversation really didn't go anywhere. But the young man went away from there having the only thing that can change him presented to him. Um, and, uh, you know, all the evidential arguments we could give him, they're not going to convince him. All the philosophical arguments we could give him, they're not going to convince him. They may, they may convict him, 
but they're not going to convince him. They're not going to change his heart. Uh, but the special revelation of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ, was given to him. And who knows what that will do. It, it may convict him, it may change his heart, or he may stand before God one day and have to give an account why when he heard the truth, he rejected it. But you planted a seed, though. Yeah. For thought. <coughs> if he's up in mind. Maybe not now, but maybe down the road. I remember talking to you. And that's, you know, and, and what you're saying there, that's just us being faithful, right? Yeah. Us being faithful to the truth of God's word. It may not make sense. It, when a person's, you know, arguing against this and arguing against that, it may not make sense just to bring them back to Scripture when they're saying Scripture is subjective. But that's what we're supposed to do. And when we're faithful to do that, even if they call us a fool, even if they call us all sorts of names and call God all sorts of names, then, like you said, we've been faithful to the truth. We've planted the truth of that seed there within their mind. And now they have to reconcile that on their own. They've got to go home and they've got to deal with that. And because we know it's the Holy Spirit who actually saves, the Holy Spirit can take that truth and use it for whatever means he wishes. Anybody know, from an apologetic standpoint, what we would call that? I'm sure somebody does. Well, we would call it again, too, that type of presentation of the gospel. So, is it an evidential presentation or is it a presuppositional? Yeah, presuppositional presentation of the gospel. Um, so. A presuppositional presentation of the gospel would be that we recognize that it is Scripture alone that changes, and so Scripture alone is the means by which we proclaim the gospel. Um, so back to the question I asked last week. Is there ever a reason to present the evidence side of things? All the time. Why? Because it's the truth. I mean, it's, it's why we're here. I mean, we're here to learn. We're here to learn about God and all the things that He has to give us. I mean, I mean, how can you not, even like driving home last night, for example, we stopped and took pictures of the beautiful sunset. That's God created. Who I, I worked with a girl over in Colorado who was an atheist, and we had a lot of conversations about atheism and Christianity. And I says, well, who made you? Who made the beautiful sky? I mean, where did this all come from? She goes like, I have no idea. And I'm like, well, I can tell you. And do you want to hear it? And she goes, like, sure. And so we just got on a Christianity type conversation. And I said, these things didn't all of a sudden appear. I mean, you are here for a purpose. And that is to learn about God and to learn to take care of everybody around you and to be decent to everybody and to be Christ like. That's why we're here. I think you make a great point um, because ultimately, all things are for the glory of God, right? And if God has created this world for his glory, then when we present the evidence of that, what we're doing, whether it ultimately saves or not, we got to give more information to get to salvation. But whether it ultimately saves or not, what we're doing is we are defending something that glorifies God. And so when the evolution, the secular evolutionary world you know, tries to tell us all sorts of things about how this world came into being. Well, defending the truth that is God's truth gives glory to God. Because what we're doing is we're bringing that biblical worldview back into the face of those who have rejected it, which ultimately serves as a conviction of their sin. They don't want to hear that. They don't want that's That's why the world is constantly trying to eliminate the idea of God and the evidence of God and, and creating something that uh, that's outside of God's created works as an as an explanation of why the world came into being. And so I do think it is important that we apologetically defend truth from an evidential standpoint as long as we recognize nobody's going to be saved if we stop there. Does that mean? Anybody agree or disagree? I think you have to be in tune too to be able to do that. You have to what? Be in tune with the Holy Spirit and that type of thing. You can go ahead and talk and talk and talk, and now you're just black, you're hitting each other and you're not getting anywhere. But if you, as a presenter, are really spiritually in tune with God, and you are really presenting it and, and being a spokesperson for Him, 
And you're going to get a, a lot further with people. I found that out in many times. You know, stuff. And you don't have to be a world scholar. You can just be a real faithful member of Christ and, and follow him. And, <coughs> and he's there if you're in there, if you're there. That, that is true. And, you know, in terms of manner, um, being in tune with God is being aligned with his word. Yep. And it's, it's the truth of his word as we're placing that within our own mind and conforming ourselves to it that, that makes us in tune with him. <laughs> And no way to read a good point, I think if we, if we, if we realize the fact that 95 plus percent of the people that we witness and are witnessing to are dead, mm -hmm. if, we, if we approach it from that, you know, then it's, it's imperative that it, we, it's imperative we share the, the scriptures along with the evidence. Um, yeah. Because that's the only way the Holy Spirit's going to work in someone's heart is, you know, is through the presentation of the Scripture along with the evidence, evidentiary evidence. But um, I think that's a, a, a freeing thing to understand too, as uh, those that believe in the, in the doctrines of grace, um, witnessing as an Armenian versus witnessing as someone that believes in the doctrines of grace is, is an entirely different because when you're on the other side you're you're sure that you can convince them but mm -hmm. you know it's your choice all you gotta yeah. you know, listen to what i'm saying and then just make a choice well that when we understand that we are witnessing to someone that is dead and their trespasses and their sin mm -hmm. then that frees us up Say, okay, I presented the evidence, but now I can move on to, to somebody else because it's after we've made the presentation, the rest of the work's up to us. God, that's the, the results. And I would say, you know, we can, I mean, I think there are multiple different types of evidence that you can argue from, right? You could, you could argue according to you know, general revelation and natural law and, and all of the philosophies and things that it, it sounds like you guys were kind of yeah. having some yeah. kind of a conversation about. But I think what you ultimately came down to was you presented God's word and then you presented the evidence from your own life, which I think is probably even more powerful than you trying to argue according to his evidence um, to be able to say, this is why I know that what we just presented yeah. to you is true. That's the true evidence, I think, that really is beneficial mm -hmm. to serves. Absolutely, absolutely, and that and that is a biblical concept. Um, so, you guys, uh, let's let's turn back over to First Peter, chapter two. And so, in the in the presuppositional world, in the world of you know, reformed soteriology, where we know that it's God who saves. And we know that no one will be saved apart from a miraculous work of God. Um, we know that it's through the Word of God that God ultimately saves. Uh, we can be tempted to just kind of say, well, I'm just going to throw the evidence, I'm just going to throw the biblical truth out there and just hope it sticks and the Lord will do whatever He wants to with it. But in fact, there's, there's also some indication here that it is the testimony of our lifestyle in conjunction with the truth that God uses to miraculously save. So it's it's not it's not pragmatism. It's not I'm going to try to be nice to people so they'll like what I have and want to be saved. But it is a testimony internally through our lifestyle of the changing gospel of Jesus Christ. So when, when we show the world through how we live that I was once dead and enslaved to sin, especially people who knew us before, I was once dead and enslaved to sin. Now I have been changed and I'm following Jesus Christ. What we're doing is we're testi testifying with our life to the Lordship of Christ. We're testifying to the true gospel. And uh, uh, first... Peter, where we at? 2, 11, and 12. We read this last week, so I just want to touch back on it. He says, Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lust, which wage war against the soul. 
Keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles, so that in the thing in which they slander you as evildoers, they may, because of your good deeds, as they observe them, glorify God in the day of visitation. Um, I can't preach a sermon on this passage, but uh, when you begin to trace out exactly what he's saying in that last statement, uh, that is an indication that those who glorify God in the day of visitation in the last day are those who have been changed by God. And so it is your lifestyle lived out in front of them that will ultimately serve as a means of changing some of them so that they glorify God when they initially slandered you. Now, I, I want to I just stop right there, though, and say that's not apart from the proclamation. There has to be, we know that there has to be a proclamation of the gospel or no one will be saved. But as you proclaim the gospel, your lifestyle must match the gospel that you proclaim. Um, I think, is, is it, and I don't, maybe Peter, I think, um, who alludes this as well, uh, yeah, I, just a little bit further, chapter 3, essentially, wives with unbelieving husbands, saying, yes. by your good conduct, by the way you live your life, your husband could then be won over. Yeah, uh, and, and it, so it's the same wording, um, and it's the same indication, and so I think that's the strength behind that interpretation, uh, because you've got it being indicated two different places in the same context, that, that, a, that a lifestyle of submitting to Christ's Lordship does serve as a means by which the Lord regenerates the heart, along with the proclamation of the gospel. Um, even even Titus, uh, in uh, in the pastoral epistles, if you turn over to Titus chapter one. Titus chapter 1, when he's giving the, uh, the qualifications of elders, you know, he sent Titus to Crete to establish churches there. And uh, as, as he's establishing churches there, one of the main things that he had to do was raise up elders in these churches so that the true gospel would be proclaimed. Because there were false teachers who essentially these false teachers' lives didn't match the gospel that Paul had proclaimed. Their, their lives were, were such that they were just like the Cretans. They were just like the, the rest of the wicked society. And so you had these men who had set themselves up as leaders in these churches who were proclaiming a different, a different gospel and whose lives were evident of that because they were, they were wicked. And everybody could see it, that they were wicked. They were just like the Cretans around them. And so it was imperative that that Titus established pastors in these churches who, and it says, uh, verse 9, holding fast the faithful word, which is in accordance with the teaching, this gospel that's been handed down, so that he will be able both to exhort in sound doctrine and to refute those who contradict. Now, verse 9, he's saying, this is the reason why they must have all of these godly attributes. So he's just given Titus a list of godly attributes that these pastors are supposed to have that qualify them or disqualify them for ministry. And so if they're living their life in keeping with these godly attributes, then they are testifying that they actually believe the gospel. And so they're able to defend this gospel because there is evidence in their life that they have believed the gospel. Does that, does that make sense? And so that was vitally important for these churches on Crete. And so what these pastors were doing was testifying to the lordship of Christ, submission to the lordship of Christ with their lifestyles. And that was pointing to the gospel of lordship that had been preached to them. It's also a testimony of a changed heart because if people are trying to live up to certain standards on their own strength, they're going to dramatically fall short if the Holy Spirit is working within them 
there will be that evidence. There will be failures, but there will be a progression towards sanctification. That is yes. evidence. Absolutely, and, and in keeping with uh, Ezekiel uh, 36, 26, and 27 that we read last week, uh, it's, it's the Lord who takes the heart of stone, he makes it a heart of flesh, he puts his spirit within us, and then he causes us to walk according to his statutes and obey all of his commands. That's a picture of salvation. That's what salvation is. Not perfection, as you stated, but evidence. Evidence of life change. Evidence of freedom from enslavement to sin. And when we talk about the gospel of lordship, when we talk about lordship salvation, submitting to Christ as Lord and following Him, that's essentially what we're talking about, right? We're talking about life change, the rebirth. And so our lives, if we're going to be evangelistic, if we're going to share the gospel with people, if we're going to take the truth of God's word and we're going to try to share it with people, our lives also have to be in keeping with this gospel that we say we believe. And if it's not, then that's a problem. And it also will hinder our gospel witness before the world. And I don't say that from a pragmatic standpoint. Understand that, you know, there are people out there who, who would say, well, we have to be really not. I mean, you just look at the LDS church and how they evangelize. They're very nice, very cordial, very respectful. And they do that because they think that it's going to convince people to, to come into the church. But we don't do it for that reason. We do it as a testimony to what Christ has done within us. And we recognize that it is the Holy Spirit who then changes. So so we're just simply being obedient. That's what we're doing. But you've got to carry that obedience with you every single day because you don't know who you're going to meet, who you're going to talk to. I've met very many people, like I've told Paul, that I have just run into or they've come to my door at my house and I'm going like, where are all these people coming from? You know, they come at 9 o'clock at night, like those ones from California. We talk for hours and I'm going like, we get on religion and I'm going like, there must be a reason why I'm experiencing so many of these people. You've got to carry that with you every moment of every day. Amen. Amen. That's true. Well, if the Holy Spirit's working within you um, during those moments, we see that as an opportunity, not a burden. Mm-hmm. And the, the Holy Spirit is <laughs> reminding us that um, we are a representative of God in those moments. And we fail. I fail all the time. But um, What's the answer for when we fail? How, how do we cry out to God for forgiveness? Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, that even, even in our failures, we can testify to the work of God that's in us because we recognize that it's only through His grace that we're able to proceed forward. And, and you know what? If we do sin, and we do sin against someone that we're trying to be a witness to even, what does the world do when they sin? Do they make things right, the right way? Try to cover it up. They don't. Yeah. Just yeah. let it go. So when we sin, we know how to make things right. And so as we do that and confess our sins and are open and transparent about the things that we do that are that are not pleasing to God and things that we do that are sin against other people, then even in that, that's a testimony to the fact that we're different. We're not like the world. You know, the young man that you're talking to, um, by taking a presuppositional truth approach, one of the things that points out to them is all the things that God has done, not that he's done. Mm-hmm. Because especially for that young man coming out of the LDS system, they're focused on works. Mm-hmm. And they were trained to do good works. Right. And um, they think that's going to get them, you know, it's, it's grace after all you can do. The problem is there's no limit to all you have to do. Mm-hmm. So you're never going to get there. Yep. And, and so but it helps them start to see con- stark contrast between what God has done and what they've done. They can start to see the gap between where what they merit, which they don't, and, and the fact that salvation is not as a result of good works. Mm-hmm. Um, so... And the big, All those things point to, to the Lord. Amen. And the big question, which is true? And if the Holy Spirit's at work, it'll eat at them until they seek after it. So. That's true. 
also, also what the, how he said Michael closed it off with scripture, I think, is we have to have enough discernment not to continue to debate when you see, uh, you know, and continue on. But the word of God being born again, not a corruptible seed, but incorruptible seed by the word of God, which lives and abides forever. Uh, you know, and to me, that's so irrelevant for somebody to, you told them, is he going to dwell on that? Is the Holy Spirit going to develop that in his mind? Uh, that the scripture says you're going to be, your mouth will be stopped. Uh, you know, that's, to me, uh, you don't have to win the argument. Now it's up to the Holy Spirit to Amen. do the least. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Yep. Absolutely. Well, anything else before we close? Good discussion. Thanks. I appreciate it. We're done. <laughs> <laughs>